Chronicle of the Times Vintage Voices from 1873 Welcome to Chronicle of the Times and this week's episodes of Vintage Voices. In today's episode we take a look at the stories from the papers in 1873. The Victorians were inventive and delighted by the odd and the unusual. We have a story about a man trying to independently fly, a sea monster from the deep found near the Japans, and a story of a wolf boy, the inspiration for Mowgli in the Jungle Book, we wonder. The major headlines that people were talking about, a range of letters sent into the papers including advice on raising children and a beauty attempt that went dreadfully wrong. Some recipes of the time. Macaroni pudding. Who knew that was a thing? And a few scandals. A regularly drunk vicar who had been hitting the sacramental wine. An American actor who is not all he seems. And a baronet who accidentally becomes a bigamist. All this and more. We really hope that you enjoy the show. About 1873. We begin today's episode with a quick review of some of the events of 1873. In the UK, the first Easter eggs are produced and marketed by J.S. Fry and Sons. The Glasgow to London Night Express offers the first sleeping cars in the UK. The first women's college, named Girton College in Cambridge, is opened. The birth of jeans arrives with patent number 139121 using copper rivets to strengthen denim work trouser pockets. The design of Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis becomes a runaway sensation with the cloth manufactured in Manchester, New Hampshire. The Greatest Show on Earth by P.T. Barnum debuts in New York. Jesse James and the James Younger Gang complete their first successful train robbery, gaining $3,000 from the Rock Island Express, worth approximately $72,000 in 2024. Colonel George Armstrong Custer has his first run-in with the Sioux near the Tongue River. Successfully passing the Royal Pharmaceutical Society examination, Alice Vickery becomes the first qualified female pharmacist in the UK. Heads of State, reigning monarch Queen Victoria, Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone, President Ulysses S. Grant and Governor of New South Wales, Hercules Robinson, 1st Baron Romsmead. What people are talking about? Mary Ann Cotton. Easily the topic of conversation for the year was what would become of one of Britain's most notorious serial killers, Mary Ann Cotton. No one knows for certain just how many she killed. Three husbands died, her mother, a sister-in-law, a lodger and at least eight children are suspected to have been murdered by her, but most believe her death count was considerably higher than these official numbers. Some newspaper reports stated that she had gone beyond the count of Birken Hare, but as Mary Ann had moved around so much, it was difficult to get an exact account. Tracing her kills was further exacerbated by missing corpses, thereby not allowing for an exhumation and testing. The Tichborne Claimant Case This case at the time was one of the longest ongoing trials, lasting and then inconceivable 
188 days. The claimant, as he was known in the papers, was Arthur Orton, son of a butcher from Wapping in East London, with a very long history of various scams in London and Australia. His more, most audacious attempt is selling himself as the Tichborne claimant. This story encompassed impersonation, identity theft, celebrity status, and the attempt to claim millions. The stakes were very high. Society was all a Twitter. Was he, or wasn't he, the rightful heir to the Tichborne fortune? Garotters. In Victorian eyes, there seemed to be a surge of cases where people were garroted on the street for the purpose of robbery. It was said that this fear was one reason for the change in the police uniform with the sturdy high neck. With this in mind, anyone caught garrotting received the harshest punishment the law would allow. This included severe flogging with a cat of nine tails. The Hollywood Murders This murder took place near Belfast, Ireland, where Miss Kerr, an elderly spinster in her seventies, and her servant, Jane Toner, are found bludgeoned, each in a most horrific way. The house has been ransacked, there are empty bottles of alcohol throughout the house, and the murderer or murderers felt comfortable enough to have a sleep after their murders for an early morning getaway with goods. The ransack included the shoes of bludgeoned Jane, the 50-year-old maid. Through unswerving and determined police work, the police managed to track down what turns out to be killer sisters. The Thames Murder Mystery Fragments of a woman's body are found drifting in the Thames. A Thames policeman found in the mud near Battersea Waterworks a portion of the left side of a female body. A corresponding right side of the torso was found off Brunswick Wharf near the Nine Elms railway station. Over the course of a few days, other body parts are discovered in various and different places. The mystery gains significance when it appears the woman was approximately 40 years of age, well nourished, and having at one time given birth to a child. Who could it be? And was there a madman loose? London society wonders. Advertisement from the Whitby Gazette, the 4th of October, 1873. Whitby Pier baths, hot, cold and shower baths of pure salt water may be obtained daily from 7am to 10pm. The Clarence bath is two shillings each or twelve for eighteen shillings. Back room bath is one shilling and sixpence each or twelve for fifteen shillings. Shower and cold baths are one shilling each or twelve for ten shillings. W. Smith, proprietor. Agony Aunt Corner. Today's letters come from a variety of publications at the time. Letter 1. To Seeking Employment. I have had many letters at various times from ladies asking me to help them to make a small income for themselves which will not debar them from living at home. One's just reached me asking me what I thought of the occupation of taking dogs for their constitutionals. If any self-sacrificing lady would like to employ herself Thus, I dare say, she might find occupation, but it would be, I am sure, of a trying kind. Spoilt dogs are even more trying than spoilt, spoilt children, I think, and are rarely, if ever, under control. Fancy the appalling spectacle of your charge fighting desperately or rushing madly after a retreating handsome, deaf to all of your calls and commands. Then imagine a still worse picture, the dire distress and wrath of the lady when her pet is restored, wounded and bleeding, or at least muddy. Of course, it's 
And it's never the dog's fault. Such a thing never happens with her, no. For the very good reason that she has bought her experience long, long ago and never takes him out. Again, I say if anyone feels equal to undertaking all of this, she may find it a remunerative employment. Letter 2. To Nil Desperandum. The outflapping ears, so disfiguring, which we often see can be so easily prevented in childhood, that it is a wonder that mothers do not give more thought to the matter. Children should be carefully watched and never allowed to sleep without having their ears closely pressed to the head. Babies should always wear caps. Then it will be impossible for their ears to assume such alarming and unbecoming shapes as frequently shock us. Letter 3 from Anna I am in a terrible difficulty. Pray help me out with it with your accustomed affability. I confess I am subject to the usual weaknesses of ladies. You know that love of admiration is the chief failing. Fancying that my eyebrows were not quite as beautiful as they might be, I was attracted by the advertisements of one of the hair-dying people and resorted to him to improve my appearance. I was ushered into a little gloomy-looking room which must have been originally a cupboard. The floor was spotted all over with black marks. The mantelpiece, chairs, tables and everything in the place bore more or less testimony to the efficiency of the dye, and the fingers of the operator would have become an ogre in a theatrical extravaganza. I was requested to sit down and shut my eyes. The operator then proceeded to apply certain chemicals, and presently he brought a basin of hot water and requested me to hold my head over it. He then commenced scrubbing my skin around the eyebrows in the most unmerciful manner with a piece of pumice stone and some soap, until my forehead smarted so much that I could bear it no longer. What are you doing? I required. Picking out the dye spots, answered he. Do you mean to say that you have dyed my skin? I asked in a rage. A little, quoth he, but nothing to speak of. I could have stamped my foot with passion. He then rubbed away until the blood exuded and I was tortured by a fearful smarting. Now, ma'am, said he, presenting a small mirror, what do you think of that? I never saw such a fright in my life. My eyebrows were a full half an inch wide and came down around the corners of my eyes like the curl of a snake. I was almost speechless. I pulled my veil around my face and rushed out of the establishment thinking that if I got home quickly I might wash the dye off. I found, however, that all my scrubbing, even with a nail brush and soap and soda, would not remove the stains. At length, I fancied I had a happy thought. I had heard, of course, of salts of lemon and lemon juice removing ink, so I thought it would be sure to answer in this case. Accordingly, I applied the juice of a lemon when, to my utter dismay, my eyebrows turned to a bright red. Oh, I was almost mad with disgust at my own folly. I dare not move out of my chamber in case my silliness became known. Sir, my eyebrows are of the most disgusting colour, and I beg of you to do two things. Publish this letter as a warning to ladies vain as myself. Give me a good and safe die with simple instructions for applying it without fear of dyeing the skin and you will thus make your treasury a true treasure to me your troubled admirer anna answer to anna the following 
Receipt copied from the shopkeeper's guide we can guarantee. Solution number one. Hydrosulfurate of ammonia, one ounce. Solution of potash, three drams. And a distillation of rainwater, two ounces. Letter four. To Amanda. The young man who spends his leisure time at a tavern does not promise to becoming a good husband. But as there is plenty of room for him to turn himself around and dispense with such a degrading habit, he ought not to be despaired of. Let him first give up the practice, and then, as his reform becomes gradually a confirmed habit, gradually lend encouragement to his suit. At present, tell him that until he changes, you will be inflexible. It is only firmness in either man or woman that will exert a salutary influence over erratic dispositions. Letter 5 to Geneva. You say you are 18 and are fond of indulging in solitude and the cultivation of poetry. This proves your mind to be in an unhealthy state. To be a hermit at your age is unnatural, and if you study the lives of the actual poets, you will find that their most admired compositions are not the result of mere morbid fancies, but actual experience, which they may have gleaned by a personal acquaintance with the world. Copy these models, abandon your seclusion, and lay down your pen until your mind has become matured by golden truths and scholar-like requirements. You may find then you are a poet. Letter 6. To Eustacey. Your question as to what age a girl may climb a tree surprises us. If a pack of wolves are after you, you should be advised to climb a tree up to the age of ninety or a hundred. Otherwise, why make yourself look like one of Mr. Darwin's monkey progenitors? Were there apples in the tree? We should excuse you so doing, but otherwise it is not so delightful to be up a tree, not a suitable position for a girl. Letter 7 from Anxious I am a married lady. A friend of my husband is in the habit of calling at my house once or twice a week and spending an hour or two with me, even if my husband does not happen to be at home. He is a very nice young man and seems fond of my company and is always respectful in his behaviour. But I wonder whether propriety requires that I should refuse him admission when my husband is absent and tell him to call again, or shall I receive him as usual? Answer. To Anxious. Have you ever read the Bible or Milton's Paradise Lost? If not, you should do so at once, and you will find that the evil spirit sought out Eve alone. He feared Adam. As a rule, married women should never receive visits from their male friends or acquaintances in the absence of their husbands. The friends or acquaintances know very well that it is a breach of etiquette, and therefore their visits prove them to be either very vulgar or very designing. A wife should prevent even suspicion attaching to her conduct. It is not enough that she is pure and loyal. She must avoid everything that might induce the ill-natured to think disrespectfully of her. Advertisement from the Whitby Gazette, the 4th of October, 1873. If you want a cheap and fashionably trimmed hat or bonnet, call at E. Cranes, 158 Church Street. A large lot of Dolly Varden hats from four and a half pence. Vintage victuals. Today's recipes come from a range of papers of the time. Stewed beef. 
Take a piece of fresh silver of beef, seven or eight pounds. With a sharp knife, make five or six incisions through it. Cut as many square pieces of bacon fat and lean long enough to go right through from one side of the beef to the other. Roll each piece of bacon in a mixture of pepper, spices and sweet herbs and insert one into each of the incisions. Tie up the meat carefully. Line the bottom of a stew pan with a slice of fat bacon. Put the meat on this with some onions and carrots, parsley, bay leaf and salt and pepper to taste. Add a pint of common claret and a half that quantity of stock. Set the whole to stew gently for some hours, turning the meat occasionally. To serve, strain off the fat and pour the gravy over it. Roasted cheese. Grate three ounces of fat Cheshire or cheddar cheese. Mix it with the yolks of two eggs four ounces of grated bread and three ounces of butter. Beat the whole with a mortar, add a dessert spoonful of mustard and a little salt and pepper. Toast some bread, lay the paste on thick. Put the toasts into a Dutch oven covered until hot through. Remove the cover and let the cheese brown a little. Serve hot. The sweet stuff. Macaroni pudding. Melt a handful of powdered lump sugar into a small quantity of water and let it boil until it acquires a deep brown colour. Pour it into a warmed plain mould which is to be so handled as to receive a coating of the browned sugar all over. Boil three ounces of small Italian pasta in a pint of milk, sweetened to taste. When quite done, Turn it out to cool and work it into the yolks of four eggs. Place the mixture into the prepared mould. Bake for about 15 minutes. Turn out and serve. Dripping cake. This is a perfectly plain cake, good for children and for luncheon. Mix together two pounds of flour, a pint of warm milk, a tablespoon of yeast and let it rise about half an hour. Then add one half pound of brown sugar, a quarter pound of currants, and a quarter pound of good fresh beef dripping. Beat it well for nearly a quarter of an hour, and then bake it in a moderately hot oven. Advertisement from the Whitby Gazette, the 4th of October, 1873. William Cole, bread baker and confectioner, 3 Grape Lane. Visitors supplied with homemade bread. General news stories from the papers. Variation on attempts to fly solo were all the rage in Victorian times. This article recounts two stories, one from an Englishman previously and a new attempt by a Belgian and its subsequent failure. From the Illustrated Police News, 21st of June, 1873, The Flying Man. Mr. Roffley, in his interesting work entitled Moving Bodies in the Air, gives an account of an eccentric and enterprising Englishman named Bat. This person many years ago made several attempts to fly over more than one city on the continent, and it would appear, if we are to accept the authority quoted, that his efforts were attended with some degree of success, for on one occasion he succeeded in flying through the air by means of an ingenious apparatus invented by himself for the space of twenty minutes. The machinery he used was much the same as, we suppose, as adopted in the recent attempt made by another professor at Brussels. That ascended by means of a small balloon. Having attained an altitude sufficient for his purpose, he unfolded a pair of wings attached to his legs and his arms, by means of which he propelled himself along. That, it appears, was overtaken by death before he could bring his invention to perfection. 
A similar attempt was made by M Monsieur Groof of Brussels a week or two ago. Monsieur Groof's attempt on Sunday to fly over Brussels was an utter fiasco. When only two or three feet from the ground, he ignominiously came down, falling on his face. The mob that had gathered grew furious at the disappointment and tore to pieces the balloon that was to have played a subordinate part of the performance. Stones were thrown about recklessly, and a scene of serious disorder was witnessed. A number of ladies were hurt, and the disturbance has resulted in numerous arrests. There are lots of tales regarding sea creatures surrounding the islands of the Japans. This is only one of them. We would like to say that Jules Verne got his inspiration for his classic 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from this sea monster story, but, in fact, the story was published three years prior. From the Illustrated Police News, the 21st of June, 1873, Encounter with a Sea Devil. We have received from the mate of an English trading vessel a rough sketch of a monster of the deep known by the title of a sea devil attacking a fishing smack. We are informed by our correspondent that he can vouch for the truth of this strange encounter which is briefly described in the paper he forwarded with his sketch. The apparently exaggerated description of the sea devil loses much of its impossibility in one's mind after an inspection of a huge cephalopoid now being shown in a house near the temple at Asaka in Yodo. It seems that a fishing boat was seized by its tentacles whilst off the village in Konomoto in the district of Kazirodod, and that the boatman killed the creature by repeated blows. Its length from tail to the insertion of the tentacles is about 16 feet. One of the arms from its junction with the body to the sucker at its point is nearly 5 feet. It must be borne in mind that the pelphus has shrunk since its death, so that living it would probably measure considerably more. From the Japan Gazette, the 23rd of April, 1873. There are several stories regarding babies raised by animals. This story, The Wolf Boy, gained much international attention. It is interesting to note that the classic Rudyard Kipling story, Jungle Book, with its hero, Mowgli, was published in 1894, nearly 20 years after this story. From the Star, the 18th of October, 1873, The Wolf Boy. You heard of the wolf boy that was captured in Ode in some time ago, writes the correspondent of an Indian paper. Two months since, he was in charge of somebody in the city, but being pestered by too much curiosity from the outside world, he nearly killed one of his tormentors. He was, therefore, taken charge of by the authorities and lodged in the lock-up near Crutchery. By the courtesy of the magistrate and collector, I was permitted to interview this youngster a few days ago. Immediately inside the gate, a boy of about 12 or 13 years of age was dozing on the hard ground of the courtyard, and I certainly should have passed him under the impression that he was an ordinary coolie taking his turn off. His head had been shaved, all but the Hindu tiki, and his loincloth was similar to that affected by the ordinary coolie, and his skin is not particularly black. He partly sat up on his visitors presenting themselves and gazed on them with a peculiarly vacant look. The colour of his eyes was that of a faded blue or grey, which is noticeable among middle-aged people whose eyes have been strictly blue in youth. Beyond this and his vacant look and mode of progression, there is nothing by which one could single him out of a crowd 
as being singular. He recollects and now somewhat imperfectly relates interesting particulars of his wolf-like, as for instance the manner in which the whelps, he amongst them, were guarded while the pack went in search of prey. The den was never without one full-grown wolf, and in their gambols the young ones were guarded by two. It was on one of these occasions that the sportsman fired at the youthful pack and missed. When they all scampered off to their den, the boy in their midst, a veritable feral natural. The sportsman, observing what he considered to be a peculiar animal, gave chase when, lo, the supposed monkey stood up and escaped into the den. He was then dug out and captured about two years ago. His habits are quite in keeping with his training. He prefers to sleep all day and to be awake or restless at night, and when the jackals give their nightly howl, he answers with characteristic vigour. His appetite is enormous, raw meat being preferred to all other food. He used to be in the habit of chopping at flies like a dog and swallowing them with unbecoming relish. His latest feat, and performed only two days before I saw him, was in this wise. A live fowl was thrown to him. He seized it with his teeth, which, by the by, are a splendid set, bit the bird's head from its body, and the quivering fowl was partly devoured before it was scarcely dead. He was made to get up and walk across the courtyard, but he was exceedingly groggy on his pins but returned nimbly on hands and knees. He has a, a, a scar immediately under his chin, where it was supposed the kidnapping wolf had seized him when he was about twelve months old, and the fact of his being suckled and brought up with a den of wolves presents curious phenomena which the mind dwells upon with considerable wonder. It was hoped that someone might claim him, but as yet... No clue has been found. Advertisement from the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, 16th of August, 1873. Wanted. Respectable man as day, timekeeper and porter to make himself useful. Address, owned handwriting, box 234, post office. Tattle Tales, Gossip Corner. Anything to do with the fallibility of the aristocracy was seized upon with enthusiasm. This story of an accidental bigamist in Ireland is one example. From the Liverpool Weekly Courier, the 14th of June, 1873, The Irish Scandal, a sad story which reaches us from the Sister Isles is much talked of here. The most lenient version that I have heard of is as follows. It seems that a certain baronet of very considerable wealth became, when quite a young man, somehow or other, entangled in a marriage with a person in every way his inferior in position and social qualities. The couple soon separated by mutual consent. The lady, well provided for, taking herself to a far distant country. Thence, in a few years, news of her death arrived, and, the tidings having been investigated and verified, the widower, after a year or two, married again, and this time in harmony with his own position, the bride being the daughter of a noble earl of the same kingdom. But it is asserted that a few days ago the first wife, veritably in the flesh, made her appearance at her husband's house, and there announced her existence, identity, and claims. A report adds that the new wife has sought her father's house, and that the baronet has betaken himself to the continent. We love this story from Indiana in the United States. It is easy to picture an actor immersed in his own self-importance being found out. What we don't quite understand is what he was wearing. Trousers by then were generally worn by gentlemen 
in most Western civilizations. From the Liverpool Weekly Courier, the 14th of June, 1873, an American stage Apollo. A melancholy fracas has occurred at Indianapolis owing to an actor being bitten by a dog. It seems that there is an actor there of such exquisite proportions that he is known as the Apollo Belvedere. He was walking in the streets the other day and excited universal admiration by the magnificent proportions of his limbs when he accidentally stepped on the tail of a terrier dog who happened to come across his path. The enraged animal immediately turned and bit the actor severely in the calf of the leg. The wounded man, however, stalked on, apparently unconscious of the injury he had received, until the bystander called his attention to the circumstance. He immediately stopped, and the utmost sympathy was felt for him and expressed by the spectators, until, to their amazement and horror, they saw flowing from the wound not a drop of blood, but a thin stream of sawdust. The incident naturally caused a painful sensation in the city and was mentioned with kindly regret by one of the local papers. This annoyed the actor excessively and announcing his intention to chastise the editor, he proceeded to the office of that gentleman to carry out his intention, but the muscles of his arms proved as little formidable as the calves of his legs and after a short, sharp struggle, he was ignominiously kicked by the editor out of the room. Altogether, he has sadly fallen into the estimation of the public, and it is understood he contemplates retirement from the stage. Another naughty vicar, but this time it is alcohol-related. A drunken vicar giving a funeral service. One can imagine the approbation. Death was taken very seriously by the Victorians. From the Penny, illustrated paper, the 19th of July, 1873, Suspension of a Vicar. The investigation into the Hindley clerical scandal was concluded on Saturday evening. The Reverend C. H. Newbold was found guilty of drunkenness at a funeral service on New Year's Day in 1873 and at evening prayer on Sunday, November the 3rd last, and of insobriety in the parish in January and March of 1872. He was also found guilty of conduct and demeanour unbecoming a clergyman. The bishop suspended the respondent from his office of vicar of all saints, Hindley, and from the discharge of all clerical functions within the diocese for three years, and condemned him in the costs of the prosecution. His lordship, while finding that the charge of immorality and indecent conduct in the legal and technical sense of the words had not been established against a respondent, characterising his behaviour as having been beyond all question most improper, indelicate and highly reprehensible. That concludes this episode of Vintage Voices from 1873. We really hope you enjoyed the show. We would be so grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. We upload three days a week. Tuesdays is our Vintage Voices series, including an Agony Aunt section, a recipe section, and the gossip of the day. Thursdays is an episode looking at the lighter sides of Georgian, Victorian and Edwardian times. And Sundays with a recounting of stories by authors such as Dickens, Munro, Conan Doyle, M. R. James and Wilkie Collins. If you like this channel, you may like our sister channel, News of the Times, which looks at crime stories from the past. From all of us here at Chronicle of the Times, thank you for watching, liking and subscribing. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.